Thank you for taking time for this webinar. It is a condensed version of the training I have given at customer facilities and at Heli Expo over the last five years. Looking forward to visiting you guys again once travel restrictions are lifted. I learn so much every time I do these sessions with uh, maintainers and pilots. So what we'll cover today is the main type of elastomeric components, how you can help them last longer and perform optimally, how to inspect them and make sure you don't remove them prematurely. Join the conversation. We're live tweeting this webinar using hashtag HelicopterMRO and follow us on Twitter at Lord Aerospace. Okay, so we'll start with the three types of elastomeric components, elastomeric bearings, dampers, and isolators. These components improve reliability and maintainability while reducing noise and vibration. Elastomeric bearings. What are elastomeric bearings? They're a unique structure made up of natural and synthetic rubber bonded to metal devices that accommodate dynamic motions. Elastomeric bearings allow limited rotational and oscillatory motions. They do not require periodic servicing. Why do we use shim in these bearings? To control the rubber bulging and provide the required stability and response to the loads imposed on the part. An important thing to remember, although elastomeric bearings are used in shear and compression, they're never used in tension. HCL bearings often use different rubber modulus to ensure even load distribution. In this test, we confirm the proper bonding of the bearing to the major metals. This test being successful, some rubber remains attached to the top fitting. Different configurations of shims are used depending on the loads and motions we are working with. These views show you the placement of shims within HCL bearings for a variety of applications. Looking at a bearing from the outside, it's not always possible to appreciate the internal configuration of shims. In this case, the Bell 412 spindle bearing uses both spherical and cylindrical shims. There is a certain level of redundancy designed into aerospace components, such as this Bell 407 main rotor hub. In the event of a complete separation of the bearing, the configuration of these parts will allow them to remain captive. HCL bearings are also good candidates for rod ends, providing they are of the right dimension. Replacing a hard bearing with an elastomeric bearing of the same dimension will not provide a reliable solution. The second type of elastomeric component is the lead lag damper. It provides many advantages over friction or hydraulic dampers. No periodic servicing or disassembly to inspect and replace internal components is required. They're also appreciated for their damage tolerance and are not affected by dust or sand. Lead lag dampers take different forms and sizes depending on the rotor hub configuration. On this uh, slide, we can see applications for the EC-135, the Dauphin, the 407, and the MD-500. Here we can see the Bell 407 lead lag damper installation. You will notice that it is captive in between the upper and the lower plate. As with other elastomeric components, Periodic destructive testing confirms proper bonding and integrity of the part. And at this time, we'll launch our first poll. Please uh, let us know what you think. The third type of elastomer component is the isolator. It minimizes loads and motions transferred from gearboxes to the airframe. As we see in this section view, the conical shape of this Bell medium helicopter mount provides redundancy in the event of complete bonding separation or in the failure of the transmission lift link. Isolators can also be made of metal tubes and rubber, such as is the case for the Bell 407 corner mounts. This installation incorporates a large washer or stop assembly to 
keep the mount captive in the event of a complete rubber separation. Fluid elastic dampers provide superior vibration dampening by targeting a specific vibration frequency. They could be compared to an encapsulated hydraulic damper. These are found on a lot of the modern helicopters. Inspecting elastomeric components. Instructions are provided by the OEM. Always refer to them when inspecting. For similar parts, damage limits may vary between OEM. And that's why we're showing here a 407 lead lag bearing, which is in good condition. AS350 spherical stop, which is actually beyond limits, and also a 412 pivot bearing, which is also beyond limits. HCL bearing normal wear will produce small rubber particles called crumbs, as we see on this 407 lead lag bearing. Some parts may be retained in service with a surprising amount of crumbing as demonstrated in this lab test article. Inspection criteria will usually be defined by three parameters, arc length, number of layers affected, and depth of cracks. Always follow OEM maintenance instructions. In the case of rod ends, a different shim arrangement is used due to concentric shims located in a small area. When two shim halves come together, this could be misinterpreted as a crack. After prolonged exposure to oil and grease, the rubber will deteriorate and start bulging as we see in these pictures. Time spent keeping these parts clean will pay off in longer lasting components. A nice feature of HCL bearings to confirm their integrity is sprue lines or also called mold lines. These should remain as a solid line when the bearing is moved. And now we'll uh, get you to look at our second poll question. Bearings tested using hydraulic power. During major inspection, please consider using hydraulic carts before disassembly of rotor and swashplate. It makes it easier to determine the condition of elastomeric components while allowing you to inspect rod ends and other components at the same time. And it will give you time to order parts uh, that need a replacement. Another way of inspecting elastomeric components is by lead leading and lagging the main rotor blades. This will allow you to determine the integrity of the various components, such as the pivot bearing on the Sibel 412. Iron oxide is a sign of fretting between laminates, indicating the rubber layer is no longer present. The OEM manuals require removal before further flight. On the Bell 412 spindle bearing, separation in this location is a cause for removal. Improvements have been made to the bonding processes to address this issue. You can see that the screw line is separated where we have that red circle. In these two videos, on the left, we show a partially separated spindle bearing. So you see that the screw lines are moving somewhat, but uh, not staying perfectly in line. And on the right side, uh, you can see that the separation is complete and there is a definite uh, step in the sprue lines. This amount of black residue is the result of a separated bearing. This area should be kept clean to ensure proper inspection. Here we see a bearing which is separated from the spindle causing damage. You can actually see daylight through that bearing. So while that bearing was rubbing on the spindle, it actually caused damage to the point that this spindle could not simply be, be repaired but had to be removed from service. Some dampers are not easy to inspect. In the case of the Bell 412, one can look at the edges to see if the damper is moved, indicating bond line separation. There is no criteria called out in the bell manual 
but this is a normal feature of the Bell 412 lead lag damper. This face of the part is actually not visible when installed. On the right side, the 407 damper shows a complete bond line separation. In this video, we're showing you a part of the 407 lead lag damper inspection, which calls for you to feel the separation with your thumb. Care should be taken not to apply too much pressure as you could actually damage a bearing that is in good condition. Having identified some separation, we proceed with a feeler gauge to measure the depth of this separation. Looking at the Bell maintenance manual for damage limits, you will see that a, an extensive amount of separation is allowed on this bearing. And at this time, we'll launch our final poll. On the Bell 407 corner mounts, you should see a stair step arrangement of the shims, as we show on the middle right hand side. If you have just a flat bearing like we see on the bottom there, that would be a sign of corner mount separation. So on the Bell 206B isolation mount, this figure provides you with an internal view of the isolation mount. Contact damage with the main drive shaft is a common cause of removal. KFlex modified 206B isolation mounts. Isolation mounts are often damaged when being modified per the KFlex STC instructions. For this reason, we're now offering them already machined. Here we see uh, common issues with Bell 206L elastomeric components. On the top there, as I'm showing, it's never good when you can see right through the bearing. The middle view shows you a fluid attack as we've seen uh, previously. And the typical separation that you'll see on the 206L transmission restraint. Some parts can be inspected once installed. In some cases, there's no provision for inspection. So confidence has to be high. Premature removal is not an option. Here, what we're showing on the right side is uh, what a 206 Lord TT strap looked like after the endurance test versus a competitor strap. So there is always somebody offering cheaper parts, but Again, you have to consider what the results are. Protecting rubber from fluids. Sealant applied in the hope of protecting the bearings. This prevents proper inspection and will trap oil on the bearing. Address the leak at the source and keep the parts clean, free of oil. Another part that is uh, constantly exposed to oil and grease is the Bell 412 aft landing strap pad. To help with this part, we've actually changed the design going away from metallic shims and using fabric shims, which makes the part more compliant to the cross tube. So this part is now available and should last at least three times longer than the previous configuration. Key takeaways. Always follow OEM inspection criteria found in the relevant ICAs. Elastomeric components are designed to wear slowly, providing ample time to notice degradation. They do not require periodic servicing as previous generation components did. Keeping parts clean, free of oil and grease will ensure that they last a long time. And at this time, we'll open up for any questions you may have.